Hello, uh, my name is Dee Stewart. I'm a professor of trombone and euphonium at uh, Indiana University, the Jacobs School of Music. Um, I'm here to chat with you a little bit today about uh, trombone and brass in general production. Um, this is something that's uh, very important to me and uh, as you can kind of tell from uh, my appearance, I've been around a while and uh, uh, may have uh, collected some thoughts that may be of value to you. Um, I don't have any notes today, I'm just going to be talking to you. Uh, and we have a limited amount of time, um, but there are just one or two overriding thoughts that I thought would be really uh, advantageous to you and to your programs. Um, I have two degrees in music education. My family has been involved in education of various kinds for generations and it's ongoing. Um, and uh, so I'm uh, somewhat conversant to what, uh, what's, uh, what we all do in education. And to me, uh, teaching is just uh, extremely important. I have been teaching since I was a junior in college, so that's about uh, half a century now, 50 years. And it's uh, fascinating to s get feedback from students, former students, about how they're doing. Some of them are in their 60s now, 50s and 60s. And uh, some of them are bankers, some are doctors, some are professional musicians, some are rock and rollers. Uh, uh, my, I think you would agree that our main interest is that when they contact you years later, that they've got a smile on their face and they're comfortable in their skin. And that's um, uh, kind, of, kind of what we do, I think, no matter what kind of education we're involved in. Um, I also uh, played in the Philadelphia Orchestra for, uh, let's see, about 18 years, a couple decades. Um, I also had some excellent teaching along the way. Arnold Jacobs, in particular, was uh, uh, f uh, primary in my, in my education. So um, I've learned a great deal from sitting beside World, some of the world's greatest musicians um, and being taught by some of the world's greatest teachers and musicians, but I think I've learned the most from my students. And some of those thoughts I'd like to share with you. Um, I think probably the best way to do it, let's see, uh, of course what I do here at Indiana University is have a full studio of uh, 18 or so students and um, that's my main job. I still play a great deal, play with various orchestras around the world actually, and, and perform uh, all over the place in recitals and uh, master classes and that sort of thing. I have a great deal of uh, enjoyment from that. Uh, but additionally, a lot of people come and take uh, individual lessons, private lessons with me. They come from all over uh, the country, all over the world really. I think it was last summer I had a student come from Korea for eight weeks with his translator and, and study with me for a couple months. I had a girl, I think that same summer, from Tokyo for a couple weeks. Um, and uh, that's really quite interesting. The, um, that type of student is usually a college student or a young professional. But what I'd really like to center on today is uh, the high school students that come and study with me. I have. Uh, over the last uh, probably 15 years or so, there's been an increasing, maybe 20 years, there's been an increasing number of high school students, mostly seniors, uh, although pretty much equally divided with seniors and juniors and occasional uh, sophomore, uh, who come from all over the country at no little expense to take an hour lesson seem to want to get that magic bullet that's going to um, help them get into the school of music of their choice, University School of Music. Um, that has kind of grown in the last couple decades and actually that, because of that, is what I, is be, that the, the concept of that is I thought if I could just get these people for more than one hour, have, have more time with them. And out of that came uh, the workshop that I do in the summer called College Audition Preparation, or we call it CAP, C-A-P. Uh, that's for winds, all, all woodwinds, all brasses, and percussion. 
and we have them for a whole week where we can really work on their on their audition uh, preparation. But let's center in on just that one hour. If somebody comes and wants a lesson for one hour, I'd like to describe that hour to you, and um, I'm going to. The, the main focus of this will be basically one thing that we'll be able to walk out with. Um, it will not, it'll be unusual. You, it may cause you to grin. It may uh, cause you some wonder. Uh, but uh, it always works. And it is something that will not be in the way of any other method or procedure that uh, uh, other people use or that you may use, um, it may actually enhance uh, some of the things that you already use, or it may be useful as a standalone procedure. So this student comes in, and I uh, we introduce ourselves. I usually just have them sit down, not even get their horn out. We chat a little while. I like to know what the student is about and uh, what his interests are. Is are is or she interested in sports, um, what other academics they're interested in, that sort of thing. And we uh, try to get his attention so that he feels that I'm his friend and he feels comfortable in the, in the studio. Um, eventually we get into uh, more musical ideas, what he would want to fantasize happening to him the next 10 years or so in and out of music. Um, most of them are, of course, 16, 17, 18, and um, I explained to them that when I was 26, I joined the Philadelphia Orchestra. So this next decade for them becomes really quite important, and they need to really address their issues uh, very well during this time period. Um, I asked them to play then a little bit, see how their horn sounds. Um, ask them usually to play something that they play very well in the beginning. What's the best thing you do? Is it tone quality? What range? Uh, pick, pick for me one phrase or eight bars or maybe a half a page of something that you feel that you play very, very well. I want them to start out offering their best. And then we may talk a little bit uh, about uh, what they need to have more work on and we explore that a little bit. Um, then I begin to talk to them about what we do as a brass player, and basically, uh, you might say the anatomy of, a, of, t of sound production is is simply uh, air flowing over the lips, causing the lips or the embouchure to vibrate. And there are many ways that people have developed over the years to analyze this, and uh, you can you can get into an uh, of the musculature, of the airflow, how much much air you use, how um, how fast the air is going, the interaural pressure, all kinds of things like that. And then um, I uh, give them a, a little smirk on my face and uh, say, "But uh, I have a tool that uh, uh, I'm not sure that you're really um, uh, up to working with, but we might try it." And uh, I'll uh, question maybe their intellectual capacity for handling this, this piece of equipment. Um, and uh, th that really gets their attention and they think, well, okay, what's this guy up to here? And uh, so then I stand up and reach into my, uh, my file and bring out this complicated tool, which is a pinwheel. Now, they think, okay, I'm paying big money, big bucks for this lesson, and this guy gives me a toy. Um, but um, I hand it to them and and uh, ask them if they know how to how to blow a pinwheel. And they say, well, oh, yeah, you know, and they'll go like that. And I say, well, no, really, really get it spinning, you know, get some air going. And uh, so we play around with ideas about how you can make it go fast, how how slowly they can they can blow it, that sort of thing. Um, it, now this uh, is kind of like a game, and uh, I try to get them to enjoy it. Uh, all the time I'm paying a lot of attention to what they do, because it's quite interesting. The high school kids usually, the younger players, usually get into this quite nicely. Um, a 
lot of the more advanced players that are highly trained um, try to do something special when they blow. And they'll focus down and they'll go and, and spend a lot of energy but not get much action from the pinwheel. What I'm really looking for is somebody to just just let their cheeks puff out and just blow the thing like any anybody off the street would do. You want to get away from the, the trained aspect of, of uh, blowing that we've been doing all the years. Um, we can, uh, if I really need to get their attention, uh, I can I can talk to them about some other tools. I mean, I've collected pinwheels people have sent me from all over the country. This one's from Italy. Uh, it's really kind of uh, hard. This is kind of like playing a low note where you've got to get all the pinwheels going at once if you can. That's a tough one to do. My wife found uh, this little one, which is more like a high note. It's on a pencil. Um, there's another one from Italy, kind of pretty, IU colors. Uh, this, one, this one also is from Italy, which is very interesting. I think that one's hard to blow. Um, and uh, somebody from Tokyo sent me this one. It's in all bamboo, just really so delicate responds to the very slightest little puff of air. Um, so by then, they're, they're beginning to get the idea that this should be fun. They just want to just, just blow. And so I begin then to, uh, to talk to them about, um, I want to translate this into the way they play. And, um, so I have them, whatever instrument they're playing, if they can get their instrument into uh, pretty close to playing position with a one-handed approach, like trumpet and trombone, would be easy to do this way with the left hand and hold the pinwheel in the right hand and um, make a little, I don't want to call it an exercise, a little adventure or a little uh, sequence of events where we blow three times. The first two times are on the pinwheel. Then I want them to drop the pinwheel. It can't be hurt because I want them on the third sequence to blow right through the horn. So it'd be like this. So they use the same kind of blow through the horn that they've been doing with the pinwheel. They're kind of playing a trick on the body to get the, to get the body blowing uh, pinwheel with a pinwheel pedagogy, you might call it, and, and apply that same kind of blowing through the horn. Not using, not introducing the tongue or anything, just blowing. One other thing that I find is helpful is to have them, uh, everybody who picks up a pinwheel and, and starts to blow it, holds it in about this position. Um, and it's interesting to see how people blow it that way. But then it's also interesting, I have them extend their arm and, and blow. And that's, uh, they automatically blow differently. Actually, they automatically inhale differently. People having it up here, take a little shallow breath and blow, but when you have to reach out with the air, then, then it's a di whole different process. You have to hit it, of course. Um, but the, So the idea, which I think is you can introduce into your ensembles, is this little three-step thing where we, and let's do it at arm's length, where we blow it twice.